Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's so wonderful to look around and see so many smiling and enthusiastic faces. Mm -hmm. I am Clary Somersall. I'm one of the senior administrators here at Montgomery College. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees and Dr. Pollard and faculty and staff at the institution, I welcome your presence here at another one of our sessions with our executives from Accenture. I take great pleasure in doing this. And it's especially wonderful to have the students from the Macklin Business Institute as participants in this process. We are in for a stimulating conversation with Steve Garcia. Our principal speaker is a person who manages large and diverse teams that pursue complex federal opportunities. I know that he has much to share with you. At the fall 2011 opening meeting at Montgomery College, Dr. Pollard shared our new Montgomery College vision statement and mission statement, which reads in part, we empower our students to change their lives and we enrich the life of our community. Our partnership with Accenture provides a wonderful opportunity to empower you our students, to examine your options for a future where you will be competing for jobs with people from Baltimore and Bermuda, as well as Germantown and Ghana. We live in a global economy, and being conscious of this fact and globally competitive are essential skills. Moreover, we are enriching the life of our Montgomery College community by launching this lecture series during this academic year. We are excited about embarking on a partnership with Accenture as part of its Skills to Succeed initiative, which plans to equip 250,000 people around the world by 2015 with the skills to get a job or to build a business. Many thanks to people from within Montgomery College as well as our partners from Accenture who have planned this series of activities during the course of this year. And Ricarda Ganjam is at the back. She's been one of our uh, primary liaisons. What a tremendous opportunity for you, our students, to have a glimpse into the world of work through the lens of a professional who operates very skillfully on both the corporate and the national stage. And now I would like to invite the director of the Macklin Business Institute, Steve Lang, to introduce our keynote speaker today. Thank you, Marie. You're welcome. <laughs> Steve Garcia is a senior manager in Accenture's health and public services practice. He provides sales and business development services and manages large and diverse teams that, as Dr. Somersault mentioned, pursue complex federal opportunities. Prior to joining Accenture, Steve worked at Deloitte, where he led proposals for the defense portfolio and helped to bring in over $300 million of new business in five years. At the age of 25, Steve became the youngest manager in Deloitte's federal practice. He's also worked for a small defense contractor, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, <coughs> and Baker Botts LLP, a top 10 U.S. law firm. Steve earned his BA in political science from George Mason University in 2003 and his MBA in 2008. He's also studied law at Georgetown University. He has a lot to offer us today, um, and we're very lucky to have him. So, Steve, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Clarice and Steve, for that introduction. Um, thank you. I'm very uh, happy to be here today, very excited about presenting. Um, in front of you and uh, teaching you a little bit about um, becoming a leader and effective leadership skills, right? Because we live in a very uh, dynamic world and I think with a lot of the technology trends um, over the next 5, 10, 20 years, we're going to see a lot of people operating globally, right, and virtually. And I think that being a leader and demonstrating and living you know, effective leadership skills is something that is key and something that will help you uh, in your career. So, 
um, a little bit about uh, a little bit more about my background, just to give you some context. Um, it was very difficult for me um, at the age of 25 to become one of the youngest managers um, at Deloitte. In fact, I was the youngest manager at Deloitte's um, public services segment, which was about almost 7,000 people um, at that time. And even though you have manager in your title, it's always going to be an uphill climb, right? Because I was faced with, well, you're only 25 years old. so someone who was lower than me on the totem pole who was in their 30s and 40s it was very hard to accept and so i had to make sure that i was on top of my a game every single day because if i showed any signs of weakness guess what these people would have picked up on that and it would not have been a good thing for me right um, first of all when you're trying to earn respect you have to uh, you have to have courage first of all right and you have to display conviction and you have to be very confident about what you do, what you say, and the actions that you take. So as a business leader, that's my best advice to you, right, is when you tell someone to do something, right, you're just not giving them marching orders, you're just not bossing them around, but you're guiding them, you're nurturing them, you're, you're mentoring them, right? You have to be something more than just a boss, right, that gives them orders. Second, when you give an order, you can't second guess yourself and be wishy-washy on something, right? You have to say what you mean, right, and do what you say. And that, right, is there's a big difference, right, between, well, I think I want you to do that, right, and I think that it's okay if you get it to me by the end of the week, right? Like, no one's going to have any respect for that, right? It's like, well, the most important thing that we ought to focus on right now is this task at hand, right? This task at hand is due this Friday at 2 p.m. There are no exceptions. This is critical and I need it done, right? And when you project confidence like that and conviction, people will respect that, right? And 100% of the time, right, and I, I manage a lot of diverse projects, right, with teams of three people to over 100 people. and. Sometimes it's herding cats, right? But the thing is, you have to be very forceful. You can't pick sides, right? You have to demonstrate uh, neutrality, and you just have to exercise your best judgment. And even though in here, in your heart or in your head, you know that you might be, some, you might be confused about something, you may not have the answers, there might be some ambiguity in the process, you can never show that, right? take it behind the scenes when no one is looking, right? You could be chaotic then, you could probably break down, do, what, do whatever you need to do, right? Throw something out the window, scream at the top of your lungs, you're having a bad day, you're stressed out, but never ever display weakness in front of the client, in front of your coworkers, definitely not in front of your subordinates, right? So that's, that's just a little opening right there. So at the age of 25, um, naturally, at that age, there are so many things that you have that I had, you know, to learn in life, right? And when I moved over to Accenture, I mean, I was one of the youngest senior managers at 29, and I'm still facing that. But again, it's just believing yourself, having faith, and again, being very strong and be, being very authoritative, right? And that doesn't mean coming across as, as elitist or as arrogant or cocky there's a fine line there and a lot of you you're gonna you're gonna read a lot of wonderful things in textbooks as I did when I was in business school but I think that when you get out and start working for whatever company you're gonna learn these things firsthand for yourself and you're gonna make a lot of mistakes I made a lot of mistakes right I'm still making mistakes but the point is to learn from them right and to never sacrifice your core principles that you have right which is integrity honesty, respect for yourself, respect for the people that are around you, right? Like never lose those set of core principles. So in a nutshell, that's, you know, there's, that's, that's a little bit about being a leader and displaying effective leadership. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the slides ahead. So today we're gonna talk about what is leadership, how to become a leader, and why do companies hire leaders, right? And leadership is, according to former President Dwight Eisenhower, leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done 
because he wants to do it. Webster defines leadership as the position or guidance of a leader and defines a leader as a person or thing that directs, commands, or a guiding head of a group or activity. Personally for me, um, my dad was in the U.S. Army for 28 years and we lived all over the world. He retired um, at the rank of a sergeant major. Um, and all my life, basically, I grew up around military. And even when I was in college, I worked for the Army Corps of Engineers and I worked for, obviously, a lot of people who were in uniform. And when I came to Deloitte and Bearing Point, um, or Deloitte rather, um, the bosses that I had were ex-military. So my last boss at Deloitte spent over 20 years um, in the Air Force. So I was very fortunate enough to be around military and ex-military, right? And there's a, a huge difference, I think, in, in the way military leaders lead and the way people who've never worn the uniform lead. And for me, the biggest difference was in the military, when you're the rank of a private, right, on the enlisted side, or if you're a rank of a second lieutenant um, on the officer side, uh, you, uh, you're basically groomed from a very young age, from day one of, of getting out of boot camp to become a leader, right? So there's always your commanding officer, whether it's a four-star general or a Fulbright colonel or a sergeant major who's over you, right? Who's teaching you how to become a leader, right? They're just not dumping things on you to do. They're just not bossing you around, but they're making sure that you're in a position in the future to take over for them when they retire, when they get older, right? Like you're the future. And at Accenture, like we groom all of our people when we hire them in from day one to become leaders. And it takes time. It, it really does. It takes time. Like I know that a lot of people come in and you know, you want to climb up the corporate ladder. I was the exact same way. But you have to make sure that when you're in charge of a group, when you're in charge of a project team, that you're ready for it. And leadership really comes with time, with experience, with wisdom, with insight from others, right? And you have to make some of those hard mistakes in the beginning to learn from them, those mistakes. There are valuable lessons that are taught to us in life that aren't learned necessarily in a textbook. And you could go through a lot of scenarios, but like I said, you won't really know what the scenarios are, and you won't really get to apply everything that you're learning in school and everything that you're going to learn with more schooling until you face the situations. So, um, with that, we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to become a leader. And so, the first thing is you need to develop a solid relationship. You need to motivate action. You need to ensure follow through, and of course, you need to lead by example. It's a little bit about what you said very important. So the first thing is demonstrating a solid, uh, or I'm sorry, developing a solid relationship and manage first impressions. So with this, managing first impressions is when you're first on the job or if you go on a job interview, you want to, of course, act appropriately, act professional, show up on time. And when you interview with someone, um, you know, don't look down your lap the entire interview. Make eye contact with them. You know, greet them with a smile. Make sure that you're dressed nicely, dressed appropriately for the occasion, right? Um, when you meet someone, smile, right? And just be confident. Be yourself. Don't try to be phony and say a joke that you don't find humorous because they're going to read that and they're going to know that you're being disingenuous and that you're not being authentic. And that's another very important thing is to be yourself always, right? Be comfortable in your own skin. You have to have high self-esteem, right? Because if you don't have any, if you have low self-esteem, if you don't have self-respect, right, you're not going to get it from anyone else, okay? So, um, of course, in a company, if you want to, you're at a social event, right? Um, maybe cocktail hour. We have a lot of them at Accenture. <laughs> um, and you see someone, right, um, like Ricardo, you know, if I see Stu Solomon, right, and I want to go up and introduce myself, assuming that I don't already know Stu, but, you know, I don't know Stu, I'm brand new to the company, I want to introduce myself, and Stu Solomon looks like he's in a really bad mood, 
because someone just told him some bad news, right? And he's standing over by the punch bowl. Do you think it's a good idea for me to go up to Stu and introduce myself? Probably not, right? Because he's going to associate, well, he's in a bad mood. So he's going to associate that bad stimuli with me, right? And he's going to remember that. So stay clearly away. You just have to exercise good judgment. If he's in a bad mood, wait probably for some other time when he's in, in a good mood, when he's excited about good news, right, to introduce yourself. So again, I think it's just, it's common sense, right? Um, listen carefully. So being a leader is just not talking, right? It's just not giving orders. It's about listening, right? You have to listen to the people on your team. And there's, a, there's just a, a tremendous amount of diversity in this group, and that's a great thing. And we have a lot of diversity at Accenture. We're in over 160 countries. We have 245,000 personnel now, the last time I checked. We may already be above 250,000 people worldwide. I mean, it's a very large company uh, with tremendous diversity, and we rely on everyone's advice and input, right? Um, there's a lot of cultural differences, and we view it as a positive thing at Accenture. So listen to members of your team. You're going to find that some people have been in your shoes before. They may not necessarily be the project lead, but they may have worked on something that you haven't worked on. They may know someone that this has worked on something that you're working on, and they could set you up. They could network you in, right? So don't shut them out simply because you're the leader, and you have to be right, and they're always wrong, right? Um, the other thing is find something to connect with someone on quickly, right? So, for instance, there's this lady who joined my group about two weeks ago, and I could tell that she was with one area of the company for about 10 years and she transferred in our group and she was really trying to get familiar with someone so she sent out an email introducing herself and in it she said something along the lines of uh, she loves renovating her house she has an older house and she likes restoring some of the the fixtures and some of the outdated things crown molding kitchen tiles things like that right and i know with me i bought a new house last year and i've been doing a lot of home renovation projects uh, along the way so it's something that we have in common and now like if i give her five minutes like she'll talk my ear off about some of the things that she's doing but we connected right away right and if i ever need her to do something for me what do you think the odds are if i asked her to do something oh man i apologize i should have given you advance notice but i really need to get this done by tomorrow could you help me do you think she's probably going to say yeah right because i'm her friend now right we've connected we share a common bond so make sure that you do that with your team members right you're not going to learn everything about someone the first day but through a series of taking them out for coffee right taking them out to lunch dinner or just spending five minutes with them maybe call them on your way home you have some time call them on a saturday or a sunday for five minutes i hate to bug people during the weekend but sometimes i'll do it if, if I'm too busy during the week, and they'll really appreciate that. They won't see you as bugging them at all. Uh, the other important thing is when you're talking to someone, and this is a big thing, especially nowadays, is put down your phone, right? There's a lot of people texting, tweeting, Facebooking, right? Like that's very popular and that's fine, but during conversation that I'm trying to have with you and you're doing this the entire time and you're passively listening to me, it's very distracting, it's rude, and it's very annoying, right? And some people will just completely shut down. It's like, I'm not talking to you right now because you're completely ignoring me. So, like, I'm just gonna move on. So, make sure that you put down your phone and you just listen to them, take the time, right? Um, and I'm skipping around here, listen carefully. Make the person feel good about himself or herself. So, I think this is a another common sense thing, right? No one wants to feel lousy, right? No one wants to be dumped on. Um, you have to, to make sure that you compliment people on your team. If they're doing a great job, tell them that they're doing a great job, right? Um, if they need improvement, um, you know, give them some constructive criticism. Don't flat out say, you suck. You're doing a lousy job and leave it at that because people are likely to break down and the whole point of being a leader is boosting morale. If you see problems, try to fix them. Um, yeah, I was recently, uh, one thing that's also very important, then I'll go into my example, is um, 
if, so, if you know that someone on your team excels in a certain area, right, and this person has a lot of I experience in this one area and they're passionate about it, maybe ask them to take the lead on that area. You know, as, as a supervisor, you know, I see that you're really passionate about, you know, X, Y, and Z, so I'm going to assign X, Y, and Z to you, and I know that you're going to do a great job on it because you know more about that topic than I do. I trust you with it. Go get it, right? Um, I was recently asked to teach a course on proposal production. Um, I've been doing it over a span of seven years now. And it's a topic that I'm, I'm very well versed in only because I've just, I've lived it for so long. And my team lead who approached me and asked me to first design the course and then teach the course, um, I got really excited about it. I didn't see it as one more thing on my list of things to do, right? I was like, I'm excited about it. When could I teach it, right? Because when she talked with me about it, she said, Steve, no one, more, n no one in this company, or at least in this group, knows more about this subject than you do, right? So that was step one, set it up, right? I'm the professional here. <laughs> step two, what, right, it's, it's sort of like baiting me in a little bit, right? And then like once she had me hooked, and step two, I know you're gonna do a great job, you're gonna do wonderful, you know, and we can't wait to hear what you're gonna, what you're gonna teach us, right? So of course, I'm still designing that course, I'm gonna teach it next month, but it's something that you have to do as a leader, right? Like make that person feel good about himself or herself, like bait them in a little bit, and then set them free to kind of work on what you need them to work on, right? Um, Let's see, find something you have in common. Uh, we've already uh, discussed that. Match their style, right? So if I'm going to work every single day in a nice suit, three-piece suit, and I notice that some of my colleagues are not wearing suits, maybe I might want to show up tomorrow and not have a suit, right? Like if it's just everyday work, I'm not meeting with a client, it's important for me to fit in, right? Like I don't want to seem like I'm above everyone else. Even as a leader, it's still very important for you to not just necessarily distance yourself from your team, right? It's okay if you go out to lunch with your team members, right? If you sit with them, if you chit chat about them. I know that with my team members, I like to chat about the Redskins all the time with them. And it just, I don't know why I do it because it just makes me extremely stressed out. Um, and, and frustrated, but that's, that's a different course, that's a different topic. Um, but, but you have to match people's styles, right? Like their body language, right? Look at how they're sitting. Are they sitting up? Are they kind of laid back in their chair? You know, um, if they're talking really slow, sort of slow your speech down a little bit versus talking fast, right? Um, now, if someone's like really excitable, they're anxious because they're, they're just focused on the mission and it, it becomes very serious now, the conversation, make sure that you adjust really quick, right? Make sure that now you're being serious as well instead of being jovial. Um, the other thing is laugh, especially at yourself. I mean, no one likes Mr. or Mrs. Perfect, right? I'm too good for you. Um, if you do something dumb, if you do something boneheaded, if you make a mistake, if you do something embarrassing, don't try to hide it. Just laugh at yourself. Have some fun. You know, your team's going to forgive you. They're going to forget about it. They're going to have a good laugh with you. Um, trust me on that one. Uh, make yourself available and familiar. So as a leader, um, I think one of the most important things is you can't close the door to your office all day long while your team is out there working on whatever you need. Sometimes you might want to go around and just visit with them. It's not necessarily standing over their shoulders because no one likes a micromanager. At least I can't speak for all of you, but I know that I don't like to be micromanaged. It's just taking the time to go out and visit with your team and you could approach them and be like, you know, hey Bob, you know, how's everything going? You're having any issues? You know, how's, what's your day been, right? Just start any kind of conversation, right? Um, some of your team members, they're going to need a little bit more coaching, a little bit more guidance, especially people who are new to your company. And so we tend to address their, their needs with a little bit more intimacy. And that's, you know, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Hey, what are you doing for lunch? Why don't we take 30 minutes? Why don't we take an hour to go out and have some lunch? You could tell me about your problems, some of the challenges that you're facing. I could provide my advice, my feedback to you. 
right? Or I don't have that much time, but hey, how about we meet up at four o'clock? Let's grab a cup of coffee, 10 minutes. You can tell me everything that you're going through and, and I'll talk with you. Spare some time, right? Sometimes I'm so busy that on the car ride home, all I want to do is just listen to the radio and sort of drive home and unwind. But I know that throughout the day, sometimes the phone's ringing. I can't always answer it right away. I take the time to call people just to kind of catch up, see how they're doing, make sure that I'm available. Um, sometimes people really don't need your advice. They just want to vent. They just want to tell you that they're having a bad day. And just listen. If they're having a bad day, whatever they, have, whatever they need to get off their chest, just let them do it right? Don't try to coach them or guide them unless they want that advice from you. So it's listening very carefully. Um, let's see, demonstrate resilient optimism. So I know that in, in the consulting industry and many other industries, as you move up the chain, your responsibilities increase. You're managing people now. You're, you have deadlines. You have reports. You have to interface with the client. Um, a lot of you in your 30s and 40s, I'm sure, will have kids, you'll have families, you'll have pets. And I know that a lot of us, sometimes when we're working on a, on a major client deliverable, we're burning the midnight oil. A lot of us will stay up five, six, seven, 15 days in a row, right? Working 15 hour days every day, right? Nonstop. We're tired, right? We're frustrated. We're stressed out. You just want to go home, you want to kick up your feet, you want to watch TV, you want to spend time with the husband or wife, right? You want to, I don't know, you miss your kids, you miss your pet goldfish, whatever have you, right? You have to demonstrate resilient optimism. Everyone on your project is like, ah, oh, you know, this is lousy, this is the worst project I've been on, the client is being unreasonable, they want this done in five days. This is easily a 20-day project. How are we going to get it done? All you hear is negativity. In the back of your mind, you're thinking, they're absolutely right, right? The client's asking us to do a lot. You can't say that. You have to be in a position where you're like, guys, I know it's challenging, right? But keep the faith, right? I know that everyone's tired. I'm tired too, right? But this is what we need to do. Keep them focused. Keep their eye on the ball right and be optimistic as a manager and a senior manager you have to you have to drink the kool-aid in the company right and you have to be optimistic when others say no this task can't be done you're the one that has to analyze it and say yes it can be done and if it can't be done we need to pull in more resources to ensure that it's getting done for our client because they're paying us to do it our reputation is on the line and if this project goes badly our job is on the line as well, right? So people in corporations, right, corporations hire us to do a job. So do your job, be optimistic as a manager. And let's see, and of course, deliver. Deliver on time, deliver what you promised that you were gonna do, right? And one last very important thing that was left off of this slide is just be authentic. We already discussed it. But as a leader, I like dealing with authentic people. I can tell when people are being phony with me. They're saying something that they don't think is funny, but they're saying it. Um, they're, they're being agreeable, even when they disagree with you. You have to learn how to speak your mind. Of course, exercise, folks, good judgment when you're speaking your mind, right? Again, it's not you suck or this sucks, right? It's like, well, I think you're doing an okay job, but there are a couple of areas I think, right, that we can improve on, right? And here's how, right? You see that different tact, right? Like one is offensive, right? The former and the latter is not so offensive. Okay, so motivate action. Um, what do you mean by that? So there's a fundamental premise that people are good, that they want to help, that they want to do good things. So make sure that when you're dealing with people that you bring out those traits. Overcome the fear of rejection. Change what you do and say and people will change their behavior. We feel good when we give back, right, and when we help others. So the first is leverage internal consistency. So what I mean by that is looking at the, the law of inertia, right? Objects in motion tend to stay in motion and objects at rest tend to stay at rest. So get people moving in, in the right direction, right? Give them deadlines, 
right? Make things priorities so people will follow through with them. And one thing that I like to do on a daily basis is to schedule a status meeting. Every single morning I have a, a status meeting for whatever project I'm working on. And it's not an hour or two, it's sometimes it's as little as two minutes, right? Hey, what are you working on right now? I don't need a status of every single little thing that you've done in the past 24 hours, but just, hey, Mary, are you having any issues, right? Bob, any obstacles that you've run into that I could help with, right? I'm more interested in identifying the gaps, right, and then keeping them forward. And so if I assign a project today to someone, and I'm like, I want it on April 15th, right? Do you think I'm gonna check in with them maybe every other day initially for the first few weeks, or do you think I'm gonna wait until April 14th, right, to find out where the project is or what the state of the project is, right? So I think it's, it's sort of like us, and I was guilty of this too when I was in school. If a professor gave us a term paper to write, right, and she said, you have three weeks to write a 25-page paper on whatever, a lot of us would wait until the night before. Some really bad students will wait until the morning of. And it's like, yeah, oh my God, 25 pages. Are you kidding me? No, it's not double spaced either. Um, <laughs> so, so the thing is, like, make sure that you're checking in with them, and it's not necessarily to micromanage. It's just to make sure that you know they're not running into any issues, that everything is going smoothly. And by checking in with them every day or every other day, however you want to do it as a as a manager. Um, that um, any issues and risk you're catching early on. You detect them, you spot them, right? You fix them right away before they spiral out of control, right? We want progress, not retrogression. Um, narrow the options, right? So as a leader, I can't just sit back and be like, well, you know, we have option A, we have option B, we have option C, right? Like people are gonna start drifting off like pick an option, that's your job, right, as a leader. Like you have to be decisive. And sometimes you're not gonna, like, no one's gonna tell you, hey, well, you know, Steve, this option is the correct one, and this one is the wrong one, now which one are you gonna pick, right? No one's gonna say that to you. You're not gonna know, right? So whatever road that you pick, stay on that road, keep a steady hand on the wheel, Right? Don't start second guessing yourself because if you're there, you know, and you've already have, you've come 50%, you have 50% more to go to meet your deadline, and you're sitting there, hey, you know, maybe it was a bad idea that I chose this. I'm starting to have some, some doubts. You know, what do you think your team is going to think of you? That's the case. They're going to think that you're an extremely weak and ineffective leader, right? Going back, we don't want to, we don't want to show our team that, right? Um, so, uh, let me see, yeah, so examine all the data, right, analyze all the data, and just do the best that you can, exercise good judgment, you're going to be working on a lot of things where you're going to be setting um, a new course, you're going to be in uncharted territory, just tolerate that ambiguity, it's perfectly okay for you not to know which road is the right one, you're not going to know until a year later, two years later, whatever, right, um, but it's gonna make you that much of a better leader having picked that road after examining all the evidence in front of you, right, and then coming to a decision. Set a deadline for people. Again, we don't wanna say, well, you know, this project is very important and we need to do X, Y, and Z, and I'm thinking that if we get it done in the next two weeks, we ought to be okay. Two weeks doesn't cut it. Right, is it on a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Saturday that you want it done? What time, when, right? Like where do you want it delivered, right? So you need to set deadlines for people. Um, expect them to do it. Like again, this, this is very important is um, when you assign something to someone, make sure that, you know, Kate, you're on the ball for this, right? I'm counting on you to get this done, get this done on time. I want a quality product project from you and I know that you could do it, I'm counting on you, right? Like they're more likely to do it, right? Versus Kate, this is important and I'll see you in two weeks when it's due, right? Like Kate's gonna put it off, right? And what you're gonna get is gonna be a pretty terrible to average project. And some clients are really picky. They see a mistake. They think that everything else 
is a mistake in that project, just one tiny little thing. So make sure that whoever the client is, for whatever client, that you're turning in perfect projects, right? They're paying us to turn in perfect projects. Make sure we do that for them. Um, make it appear simple. So we have a lot of extremely complex tasks, right? Especially with some of these large teams that I work with where we may have 100 activities that need to happen before the deadline. I'm not just gonna put up a list of all the activities that need to happen. It's overwhelming. Like, you'll, you'll scare someone. I mean, people will, it's just, it's just process overload, right? So I like it, right? Certainly from the mentors that I've had in my life say, okay, this is a very difficult task that's in front of us, right? Step one, Bob, you're gonna do this, right? I need it by Tuesday. After you turn it into me on Tuesday, Kate, we're gonna take over and do the following four things. Here are the four things, one, two, three, four. Kate, after you're done with it by Friday, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly on Monday morning. Kelly's gonna do the following things. See how I'm like calmly explaining all of the steps versus like, here's 100 activities, you're a sign of this, you're a sign of this, you're a sign of this, right? Like I'm just kind of parsing it out for them. Break things down so people don't get overwhelmed, right? Um, that's, that's also a very easy way to get people to stick with the team. Um, I've been on a lot of horrible projects in the past where we've had people quit early on because they're just, hey, this is way too much work. Like, we're going to be up consistently. We're not going to get to enjoy any of our weekends, right? And we desperately needed those managers to step in and be like, guys, I know this is difficult, but, you know, rest easy, right? I mean, let's, let's break this down. Let's peel the onion back layer by layer right and let's get there slowly and incrementally we'll get there together right um, make it their idea we talked a little bit about this already is um, again if, if I want someone to do something for me I have to make it seem like well it was their idea right maybe they suggested something hey I like your suggestion good let's go with that right now the onus is on them to do the project right Offer an add-on. So at Accenture, we have um, accounts to where you know, some of the partners in the company get to want and dine us, right, for doing a great job, going above and beyond the call of duty, right? It's just not simply doing your job, great, I'm gonna take you out to lunch or dinner. No, you're getting a paycheck for that. But it's like, wow, Steve, you worked really hard, right? You worked eight weekends in a row, and this is an actual real life example now, I did work eight weekends in a row. <laughs> um, you did good, so I'm gonna give you a nice cash bonus and we're gonna go out to a nice steak dinner at Morton's, right? Buy whatever you wanna buy, right? Steak, wine, appetizers, it's on us, right? It gets people to wanna do a great job, right? And to kind of come in on the weekend, because let's face it, no one likes coming in on the weekend right, unless you just absolutely love working weekends. Um, and I have not found uh, that to be the case with anyone on my team. Um, be persistent. Again, just make sure that when you give um, a task that you're keeping on top of people, right, making sure that you're doing the daily stand-up calls with them, right, that you're having status meetings. It's not micromanaging them, you're just making sure that they're, they're working on the project, they're not having any issues. Um, if they need to talk about anything, you're available, you're there. Uh, the communication is daily or it's every other day, however long it needs to be, or durations rather. Uh, just be persistent. Um, so ensure follow through is uh, one of the other tenets of effective leadership. And one important thing is get a verbalized commitment. So after we have a kickoff meeting, and we assemble the team, right? We gather them and this is the project, this is the mission, these are the objectives, now these are the tasks, right? And this is what I want people to do. Here are some of the due dates, right? Um, do you understand, right? And some people will just nod their heads after I ask, yeah, we understand perfectly, right? They just nod. As a manager, do not take that as they understand everything, right? Get a verbal commitment from them, right? Ask them, can you replay back your responsibilities on this task? 
I, I like to hear it out of your mouth, right? So there's no miscommunication. Because sometimes they're looking at you, but they're really not paying attention. They, they're daydreaming, they're thinking about something else, I don't know, right? But make sure that before you leave the room that they understand that you hear it directly from them, what they're responsible for on the project, and what they're aware of all their tasks and when the deadlines are. Um, help them visualize how they'll do it, right? So um, I know that I'm a bad cook, so my mom will typically you know, get on the phone with me when I'm trying to make a grilled cheese. Um, <laughs> and she's like, uh, okay, Steve, let's visualize this together, right? You're gonna open the fridge, okay? You're gonna grab some bread, you're gonna grab butter. You're going to butter the bread, right? Like, it's easy that way if you help someone visualize something. And a lot of tasks are very hard to do unless you start whiteboarding stuff, right? Use arrows, use blocks, use animals, use, I don't care what you use, sock puppets, right? But you need, to, you need to help people visualize a task, especially for us visual learners that need to see it and not just hear it, right? Um, ask for a time frame. So get a commitment from someone, right? So if you assign someone something or someone says, you know, Steve, I think I could do this part of the project. Great. How long is it going to take you? When do you think you could have it done? By what date? By what time? Right? Like, just don't let them leave without getting some kind of commitment and hard deadline from them. Um, create a sense of obligation. So, um, this is uh, this is very important right here. Is creating a sense of obligation because it's something that I um, I always try to do as a manager. Is um, I know I could count on you to do it. Right? You are the perfect person for this. Right? Like you're smart and I appreciate you stepping in. I appreciate your leadership and your willingness and your desire. And I can't wait to see the project, right? You're getting, you're creating a sense of obligation for them rather than, Bob, this is just a task that I want you to do. Bob's not gonna care about that task. He's just gonna complete the task so you get off his back, right? But if you're like, Bob, I'm really counting on you to do this because you're the perfect person for this. And I know, Bob, that you're not gonna let me down. Do you think Bob wants to let his manager down? Probably not, right? Especially if I'm Bob's raider at the end of the year, right? And his bonuses and raises depend on what, what rating I give him. Um, show your success is dependent on them, right? So Bob, you know, before I frame the house, I really need you to pour the foundation, right? Uh, this is a critical task. This is a critical path item. So before I can begin my stage of the project, right, it's dependent on you finishing up what you need to finish up before I could take over. So Bob feels literally like he's the bottleneck. So if he gets something to you late, that causes you to have a late start. It causes the next person to be late, right? So make sure that everything hinges on them, especially something that you want done right away. It may not necessarily be, necessarily be true, right? Like you may be fibbing a little bit, right? Um, not outright lying, just fibbing, um, by saying that this is a really important task. And, and you know that deep down inside it's really not, but you want it done and you want it done right away. You need to kind of light the fire under, under someone. Um, lead by example. So I think some of these bullets that um, I'll talk about are, um, you know, commonsensical. So be respectful of everyone, right? No one wants to work with someone who's disrespectful. No one wants to be classmates with someone who's disrespectful, right? Or, a t or, or have a teacher who's disrespectful. I think this is, this is just common sense. Um, another thing about being disrespectful is never yell or raise your voice to someone. I know that a lot of us get really agitated or aggravated easily and we get stressed out and we just want to yell. I've had to bite my tongue so many times through the years. Um, I remember on a project I was working on, I spent five hours um, the morning of looking at this document and making edits to it. And when I gave it to uh, the manager who asked for it, he, uh, he said, oh man, Steve, I apologize. This document doesn't look right to me. I think I sent you the wrong version, right? Like it took every ounce of restraint and discipline that I had in me to bite my tongue because there were other people present in the room 
we had some of our teaming partners in there from other companies that were helping us on the project. And you definitely don't want to start a fight with someone or raise your voice in front of teaming partners, in front of other team members. It just looks horrible, right? Avoid criticizing others when they're not present. So if I'm having an issue with Kelly and Kelly leaves the room, I'm not gonna start bad mouthing her. And it's okay because she's not here, she can't hear me, right? You don't wanna do that. You don't wanna avoid anything because what you say will and can come back to haunt you. So make sure that you remain very neutral, that if you're going to criticize someone that it's constructive criticism, that you do it face to face. Keep the personal attacks out of the way, right? And I think we all know what personal attacks are. Keep it at a very professional level, right? Um, charisma is gained by showing people how great they are, not by showing how good you are, right? So it's not about the Steve show all the time. It's about looking around this room, right? And looking at all the diversity that we have here, right? The amount of years of experience, right? The, the different offering that you have to bring to the table, right? And it's, it's pulling all of that in and learning from it, right? Looking at our great team versus just the great leader who leads it. Um, and the other thing is avoid arguments, especially ones that you can't win, and never argue with an idiot. It's hopeless, it's pointless, and it's dumb, right? So my, my partner is always, and this is Accenture, right? We, uh, they're caught senior executives, but they're partners in the company really because they own like a, a stake in the company. So if the company does well, they do well. So the partner who's in charge of my group is always saying um, that 10% of people will never get what you say. They'll never get it it's in one ear out the other. Not, uh, 80% will get it right away. We get it, it's common sense, no questions from us, right, we're okay. 10%, they need a little bit more persuasion, right? They need you to explain things more thoroughly, but eventually they'll come around, they'll understand. The idiots, right, are the 10% who never get it, right? They're just being argumentative for the sake of arguing with you, right? Those people tend not to last very long at Accenture. They don't last very long at any company. They're very stubborn. Don't pick a fight with them because you're not going to win that fight, right? Don't go down to their level. Um, the other thing is, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? What I mean by this is in the workplace, there's a lot of rumors that fly around about people. Hey, you know, we heard that Bob really did a bad job on this project. And, you know, we heard this and that. And we heard that he may be fired for it, right? Make sure that these rumors are true before you speak them, before you spread them, right? Like, first of all, don't spread rumors, but before you confront someone about it, make, validate the rumor, right? It, it might be completely false, right? Is it kind? If it's gonna hurt Bob's feelings, if it's something that's personal, right? Like maybe it's about his personal life, he had just got a divorce from his wife, right? Like maybe we don't wanna bring that up because it's not a very kind thing. And is it necessary, right? Like, do we need to say, it? is it critical that we tell Bob something, right? Or can we just not say it at all, right? No harm done if we don't say it. Um, always speak about others as if they could hear you. So again, this is, you wanna demonstrate and exercise neutrality. You don't wanna pick sides. You want to keep the conversation very clean, very professional. You definitely don't want to talk bad about others, not in front of them, not behind their back. Um, always speak as if others could hear you. And you definitely don't want to put the company, whatever company you end up working for, maybe Accenture, in a bad position, right? Because rumors spread very fast in the rumor mill. And I know that you know, we have some people that say things that may jeopardize the company. And the last thing that we want is for a news reporter to be calling us about it or to read about it in the Washington Post, right? Like, I mean, it's an extremely bad situation for anyone to have to be in. So make sure that whatever you do say, um, it's not vicious. And, um, and if you're gonna say something about a person, make sure that they're there um, in front of you so you can provide them with that, with that kind of feedback. Um, take the initiative. So, 
A couple of weeks ago, um, I was working on this project and we were about 95% done with it. It was two days before the due date and a senior manager, same as me, came in and she was asked to help out, pitch in, and she was frantic. I mean, she was a tornado. She just ripped through there and she was like, I don't see this. I don't know where this is. I'm like, that's because you've been on this project for two seconds. You don't know what's been discussed for the past two months, right? like calm down. So I saw that as, a, you know, as I took the initiative, right, and addressed it as this is an opportunity for me to come in, kind of level set expectations, clearly explain to her what had been done, right? I was very calm. You could tell in her voice that she was stressed out. She was speaking fast. She was frantic. So what I did is, you know, Mary, the first thing that we need to do is calm down, okay? Like, I caution you, two days left in the project, we don't want any chaos. We have this smooth process, here's what the process is. Mary, this is what I need you to focus on, right? So rather than having her run around all over the place unsupervised, I focused her on a task that she was very good at, right? Like, we just need that kind of organization. So take the initiative, if someone comes in, right, and you know that you have more knowledge about the situation and the facts than they do, then step up, be a leader, and tell them, like, this is what's been done, right? This is how the process is working. This is how it's going to work, and this is what we need you to do. Um, manage your passion. So a lot of people at work, you know, they get really excited about certain topics. They're really passionate about them, and a lot of people like to push others out the way. You know, you don't know as much about this as I do, right? Like, I'm going to take the lead on this. For goodness sake, like don't push people out the way, don't silence them, you know, invite them to help out, you know, give them something to do. Um, passionate leaders are great, but you have to be very careful that you don't mistake passion for leadership because there is a huge difference, right? When I lead teams, again, I have to do so by looking at the facts, right? Like show me the hardcore facts. And sometimes it's about you know, I'm sorry that your dog passed away. I'm sorry that, you know, your grandmother died. But we have a responsibility to our clients to get this done. Now, you know, if you need to take some time to grieve the loss of your animal, to grieve the loss of your family member, that's fine. I perfectly understand that. But we need to get someone to step in for you to, to finish the rest of the project, right? Like, make sure that, um, that you know, there's someone there that, you know, you're keeping your, your passion in check, right? That you're keeping your emotions in balance, in check. Um, again, I like to look at, there's, there's no gray area with me. It's just black and white. And as a leader, it's, un it's very unfortunate for sometimes. We can't always sympathize with people, but we have to remain very deadline driven. And we have to, we have to keep on top of schedule, right? Make sure the project gets done on time. Cost, make sure that the project is under cost not over cost, and quality. Make sure that we're delivering quality to our clients. We don't want to deliver them bad projects. And you have to literally see things in black and white and look at metrics, look at the numbers, right? Um, reflect credit for accomplishments. This is very easy. If, you're, if it was a team effort, if you stayed up late doing something, make sure that you sent out an email, make sure that you thank everyone on the team, um, I do it all the time for people that I don't even supervise. If they help me, I'll send a quick note to their supervisor. Hey, I want you to know that Bob stayed up, you know, this like until 3 a.m. last night working on this. He was working last weekend. Bob was inter instrumental. I could not have gotten this project done without his help, right? And I'll make sure that he gets credit. I'll make sure that his supervisor gets that email, right? It's a very important thing for people to get credit for what they do. So they have energy to go on to the next task and the next task, right? So thank them and be very humble. Um, look for what's missing. Um, so again, you have to look for what's missing on a project, right? Gaps, issues that you have, right? If something's not going right, you may have to throw down the, the yellow or red flag. You may have to call a timeout. You may have to refocus the group. Um, but it's important for you to catch, detect mistakes early so you can fix them. And tolerate ambiguity. We talked a little bit about this earlier. Sometimes you're going to be venturing out into the unknown, uncharted territory. It's okay if you don't have all the answers, 
you know, your team doesn't have the answers. So make a decision, right? Stick to your decision, stick to your guns. Don't waver back and forth. Don't flip flop, right? Keep a steady hand on the wheel. And I think this is one of our last ones here. Lead by example. Um, learn from the people that you lead. Every single day, um, I'm learning from people on my team, whether they're analysts, right, starting fresh out of college, whether they're consultants, um, or I learn from the people, obviously, who are above my rank. Um, and it's wonderful to kind of draw their feedback. You know, there are different backgrounds and diversity. It's only strengthened me. Like I said, um, I became a manager at 25, a senior manager under 30. Um, it's very difficult to do at Accenture, you know, under 30. A lot of senior managers that we have that make that rank are typically in their 30s. Some are even in their 40s when they make senior manager. I learn from the people around me, right? But here's the very important thing. I've worked with a lot of great, wonderful people with, so, with great leadership styles, right? But I've taken a little bit of their leadership styles from these people and I've incorporated it into my own style. But it's my own style overall, right? It's okay to borrow from others, but don't, don't copy them exactly, right? Like you have to be authentic. You have to be yourself as a leader. Don't try to copy someone else because it's not going to work for you. Right? You have to be comfortable with the advice that you're giving, right? guiding others. You have to be comfortable giving orders to people right? and mentoring them. Um, make decisions based on appropriate data and facts. Again, it's not about like, I feel that we should do this because you know, I heard that if I do it like that, no, none of that stuff. Right? Like you have to make decisions based on the facts. right? Look at the numbers, look at trends, examine everything that's in front of you. You may want to talk with others, talk with your superiors, talk with your team members. At the end of the day, that decision is yours. Um, communicate clearly, concisely, and simply. So one important thing is not to sound too formal when you're writing an email or when you're speaking with people, right? Like you could sort of let your guard down a little bit. Any preconceived notions that you may have about corporate America, how you always have to be on top of your A game, you can't let your guard down, you have to always kind of be like stiff, like very robotic. It's simply not true, right? Like it's okay to minimize your words, like no one's gonna wanna read. I know that I don't like reading, you know, emails that are two to three paragraphs, like cut to the chase right away in an email. I don't like replying in two to three paragraphs. Sometimes I'll shoot an email with yes or no or sure, right? Because I just, at the end of the day, when you're, when like literally you're getting 200 emails a day or more, you just don't have the time to be that thoughtful for each one. Um, the other thing is speak with confidence and conviction. We talked a little bit about this already. Very important for managers and senior managers and partners and so forth in a corporation to always speak with conviction and with confidence, right? It's a, it's a sh show of strength. If you have a question, Right, ask your question. Asking questions of people, asking for clarification is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength, right? I'm unsure about stuff every single day. I always ask my supervisors. They appreciate that because it shows them that I'm thinking about it, that I'm paying attention, right? That it's only gonna strengthen me when I need to do something that I already have their best advice at hand. Um, say thank you, again, Sometimes it, de it depends with the people that you work with. I mean, I know that, you know, one time I worked on a project for, you know, 16 hours every single day for the final two weeks of it. I was burned out, right? The project leader on it didn't even say thank you. Didn't even say thank you to the entire team. Like, I flipped my lid, basically. Not like at home. I was basically banging in walls, but thing is, like, I was pretty mad. Right, like I had done so much work, sacrificed so much of my time because I cared about that project. I wanted to see the project leader succeed. I wanted to see my coworkers succeed and Accenture succeed, right? But it's extremely disheartening for someone not even to say thank you. It's two simple words, right? Um, make sure that you say them. Um, I don't think it's sufficient to say, oh, it's fine, right? No, don't say that, right? 
take, the resp take responsibility for influencing others to implement. So I'm 100% responsible for the things that I have to do in my day-to-day -day job, right? In my day job, that is. I'm 100% responsible for the company. So any, er, whenever I'm representing Accenture in front of the client, in front of this class here, I'm 100% responsible for my actions. If something doesn't go right, there will be consequences, right? I'm not 100% for any, I'm not 100% responsible for any of your actions, right? You may be on my team. I'm not 100% responsible for your actions. At the end of the day though, my best advice to all of you guys is as a leader, you have to make sure that, you know, I'm counting on you to be professional, to be courteous, to be on time, to be committed to whatever you do. Because when you're out there and I can't see you every single day, I can't be with you 24 seven, you're representing me. You're representing the, you, the company, right? You're 100% responsible for your actions. Make sure that they know that, right? And the onus is on you to tell them that. You're 100% responsible for telling them that, right? But if they go out and they do something that's boneheaded, at least you've given them the heads up that you expect them to be 100% professional at all times when they're on the company's uh, dime, right? Be courageous. A lot of us are afraid to speak up. I remember when I first entered into this industry eight years ago, I was a very shy person, right? I was an extremely passive person. And it took a lot of cycles. It took a lot of projects. It took a lot of coaching and mentoring to, to basically get me to come out of my shell. Um, and every single day, all of us are going to be a little bit scared going into something, right? Some of us aren't good public speakers, OK? Some of us are afraid of heights. But in, in a company, right, like the client is asking you to do something. And sometimes it's not always acceptable to go tell your boss that you're going to sit this one out, right, or go do something else. You have to do your job. And sometimes it just, it's venturing into the unknown. Just be courageous about it, right? Put one foot in front of the other and be strong, right? Keep faith. Um, so why companies hire leaders? Um, well, past performance is the best indication of future success. So typically, in interviews, we will look at your extracurricular activities, we'll look at your transcripts, and we'll look to see what kind of grades you got. It's an indication to us that, hey, this is a straight A student. The student got A's and B's. They worked very hard. It's not necessarily, did they grasp the concept? Well, obviously you did. I mean, if you got an A in the course, you grasped the concept. If you got an A or a B in something, it tells me that you buckled down the night before, right? You buckled down, you studied hard, right? Like you're a good student. You know how to organize your time, time management skills. You know how to focus on something. That's what we're looking for. That's what your grades tell us when you're interviewing at Accenture. Extracurricular activities. It's good not to just be a student, right? But be a corporate citizen. Get involved with your school. Get involved with your community, right? If you're, you know, the captain of the swim team, right? Or if you do a lot of volunteering with your local food bank, with your church, that's a great thing. It shows that you're willing to do more than just, well, your normal day job, right? Which is being a student, right? You're willing to go out there into the community. You're willing to put you know, yourself out there, you're willing to help out. And we love that at Accenture. We have a lot of programs and internal initiatives that uh, people volunteer for. Um, it's not a requirement. Like being here today is not a requirement. I volunteer to do this. It's something that I feel very passionate about. I'm glad to be here. I don't get paid more to do it. I don't get kudos for doing it, but it's something that makes me feel good, right? I feel like I have something to offer. Um, and it's something that I want to share. So make sure that in addition to being a good student, as I'm sure all of you are, make sure that you're taking the time to volunteer, whether it's at school, whether it's with your church and your community, what have you. Uh, just be a good corporate citizen. It goes a long way and you'll learn a lot in the process and it'll strengthen you as a person. And it's one more thing that you can put on your resume when you interview with Accenture or whatever company you end up, uh, you end up applying for a job with. Um, and let me see here. So meeting each other's needs. So what you're seeking, I'm sure that all of you want to work for a reputable employer, 
all of you want variety. You don't want to be stuck on the same project day in and day out until the day you're ready to retire, right? You want development opportunities. All of us are still students, right, of the earth. We're still learning, right, no matter if we're 20 or if we're 75, we're still learning something new every single day. You're probably seeking challenging and interesting work because no one wants to hole punch papers all day long and feel like that's the only thing that they're doing and they're bringing no real actual value to the table. Um, you want diverse colleagues and clients, right? Like you don't want to just work with a bunch of people who seem like it's cookie cutter, right? Like a bunch of robots. You want individ individuality, you want self-expression. You want to work with people who are very dynamic. You want to work with people or with teams that are collaborative and that are synergistic. Um, and of course, this is a big one, traveling. With Accenture, I've gotten to travel to Chicago, San Diego, Austin, Florida, a couple of other places. Um, if I was in our, uh, our health practice, I know that one time my supervisor was trying to get me to go to Canada for a few months. Um, we've, got, we've got 160 offices all over the world. You may not get to travel to all of those offices, but with a consulting company like Accenture, you will get to travel, I guarantee it. Um, so what we're seeking, we're seeking strong leaders, people with a desire to work in information systems. So as business majors and finance and accounting majors, this may seem like a little bit strange when I say, you know, ERP system implementations, software engineering, maybe Cognos, Oracle, SAP, right? It's all foreign language to you guys, but we are seeking people who want to work with that. Accenture is the number one ERP systems integrator in the world, bar none, right? Like that's basically our bread and butter. No other company does it better than we do. And we're seeking the next generation to come on in and be systems integrators with ERP, whether it's SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, Java. We're technology agnostic, meaning we don't advocate for one platform or the other. Whatever our client wants, we'll deliver, right? We'll work with them and we'll deliver. You probably want flexibility and ability um, to travel, right? Maybe work from home. So here's the nice thing. Accenture is a virtual company, um, or I'm not going to necessarily say that, but it's a trend that we're seeing in more and more companies, and Accenture is not an exception to this. Um, I work from home two to three days a week. Uh, we have teleconferencing that we have. We have webcam. You don't always need to be there in the office. There's um, a trend now for a lot of major corporations, Accenture, Deloitte, IBM, to consolidate the amount of office space that they're renting, that they're leasing, that they own, because it's, it's about reducing the carbon footprint. It's about, you know, better commute time for people, right, giving them a flexible schedule. So I know that a lot of the, the generation that we're seeing today that come out of college, it's, it's high on their list. Right, and Accenture certainly advocates that. We are not traditional nine to nine to six, nine to five environment where you have to be chained at your desk all day long. Right, like sometimes I don't even see my team members. Um, I spoke with my boss two weeks ago. Right, I saw my boss three months ago. Right, but we, I mean, we communicate through email over the phone. It's probably every two weeks just to catch up, see how I'm doing, um, and that's fine. If you're doing a great job people aren't really going to bother you. If you know your stuff, people are going to leave you alone, right? But if you need a lot of help, right, as a manager or as an employee, make sure that your boss, right, is giving you enough time. And Accenture is one of those companies where we have career counselors, right? So when you come in, right, everyone is assigned a career counselor. I was assigned a career counselor. Um, it's basically someone who advocates for you on your behalf. They mentor you, they guide you, they help you understand the company. And when I was at Deloitte, they had the exact same program. Um, I can't speak for other companies, I don't know, but typically in your first few days, weeks, months there, you will have someone that, that basically advocates for you, that shows you the ropes, right, so you get situated. Um, we're looking for team players. We're looking for quick learners, people who are, who could easily adapt. And we're looking for effective communicators, right? People who are active, people who aren't afraid to speak their mind, right? Or to be uh, very direct. It was a pleasure being here. <laughs>